What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. This is Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. You know, um, this is part of, I decided, Adam, to do an Israeli entrepreneur series because talk about grit and talking about a nation that has so much innovation and in, in startups and amazing things going on. You know, past guests, uh, Moise Navone of Mobileye, you know, talked about when their journey to getting acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion. And um, what struck me, Adam, about him telling that story is he had to take pay cut after pay cut and just work so long, so hard. And he had to go at one point to go back and tell his kids, you know, uh, I'm pulling out of all extracurriculars and wife, we, we have no eating out, no niceties because of the journey. You know, obviously it ended up, ended up good, but they didn't know that going going on the journey right so check out that and many more stories on spiritinsider.com the episode is brought to you by rise 25 which i co-founded with my business partner john corcoran and what we do is we help b2b businesses connect to their dream 100 clients and referral partners by running their podcast for them and we do that adam because i've seen no better way to give to people you know i love giving to people and forming relationships with people and i can have people like adam who i meet and become friends with and hang out with because and further relationship with and tell people what he's doing through the podcast. And it was actually inspired by my grandfather. And I don't even know if you know this story for many years, you know, I, the Holocaust foundation interviewed my grandfather because he um, was the only person, him and his brother were the only people out of their family to survive the concentration camps in Nazi Germany. And so, um, his legacy lives on. So yeah, like this is amazing. And Adam has some amazing things to share, but I also consider it helping you and me leave a legacy beyond ourselves. And so um, if you have questions about podcasting, I think it's the single best thing you could do for your business and relationships. Go to rise25.com. And today uh, we have Adam Feldman. We've been trying to arrange this for, for, for so long. And before I introduce Adam and their amazing company, I want to thank Justin Goff and Stefan Georgie from Copy Accelerated because I met Adam through there. You know, he is definitely one of the experts that were there talking to people about how you scale brands and how you scale companies with traffic and in all the things involved with with traffic, of course. So, Adam, thank you both. Uh, Adam Feldman has been with uh, Kendigo since its inception, since 2012. He heads up business development and many more functions. And basically, what they do is they drive large volumes of high converting traffic for themselves and for their clients all right what happened was they had this flagship program called trim down club and it's achieved amazing success they've helped over two million customers in countries all around the world lose weight and live healthier lives but what happens adam with that is they were so successful with their own products that people are saying how can you help me right and that's what always happens and they decided probably at some point to give in and be like, okay, we'll help you. Um, and so businesses all over the world um, hire their agencies to run their proven PPC and monetization strategies. And basically they help scale direct to consumer brands to eight figures or more. And that's kind of what I titled this is how to scale direct consumer, direct to consumer brands to eight figures or more. So Adam, thanks for joining me. Israeli time. Yeah. Great to be here. Five five twenty here, guessing early morning for yeah. you. Even on Memorial Day, I'm like coming in the office <laughs> yeah. because we've had such a hard time arranging this. Yeah. Ryan Lee says, "What's up, Adam?" Um, nice. Tell him and that. you know, well, I want to start with just talking about the the story, what you guys do, and just a little bit about your story. Yeah. So the the story behind us is is really unique and uh, interesting. So. We started about 15 years ago, actually, the, you know, from day one. Um, we were founded by two entrepreneurs who are tech wizards or geniuses, engineers, you know, data scientists. And uh, we quickly, with them, became uh, leaders as affiliates. So super affiliates, monetizing and promoting different leading offers, let's say on ClickBank, 
because we were pretty much with ClickBank when they first started and then working with other companies in the health and wellness uh, niche. So we were working with companies like Biotrust exclusively for Google traffic, like GDN, Google Display Network, which is very cold audiences. So it takes a unique skill um, as well as Beyond Diet and also Trim Down Club, of course. And we decided to, that's when we kind of decided and said, look, let's actually create Trim Down Club. So that was around that stage where, look, we were doing great with traffic. We were an affiliate. Everything was great. But we said, look, let's try to bring something else to it. Instead of just doing traffic, let's try to do the marketing and the vendor side. Um, we feel we can do really good there. So we started Trim Down Club about, about eight years ago now. Um, Trim Down Club has been running on paid media for as long as it's since inception, which is about eight years on Facebook, on Google, on Taboola, on Outbrain, on Pinterest, Instagram, YouTube, everywhere that there is traffic on tier one, so the best traffic globally, we would run it internally with uh, Kendigo, with our uh, media teams and creative teams. And we took that, like you were saying, and acquired over 2.5 million. It's probably closer to three now for that brand, different funnels, different optimization practices, um, different strategies creatively and so forth. And, and that's been, you know, it, it was this, the biggest piece of what we were doing until recently. So about two years ago, going on three, we started the agency, which is now called Kendigo, but before it was called B2C Media. And we said like, look, we're, we're the best vendor in our opinion for digital health and wellness in digital in general. Um, we know how to run traffic the best. We've never had any other agency outperform us or media buyer um, for our internal brand. So we said, why don't we become an agency for others? As you said, people were asking for it. They saw all the success um, from our campaigns for years um, and some of our work as an affiliate. So. We ended up making that move um, to becoming an agency. And ever since, we've been just aiming straight up. It's just been hyper growth. You know, each quarter, I think we're doubling in revenue at this point. And we went from when we made the switch to becoming an agency, we had about 10 employees at the time. Um, we were always upsizing and then downsizing, but it, was, it wasn't it was balanced and it was just all over the place um, when we were an affiliate as well as a vendor. And then once we became an agency, we ended up growing to 60 plus now. And that's even more if you include freelancers and outsource. And by 2021, I'm guessing we'll be at 100 plus. Mm. And for an agency, especially a direct to consumer agency, that will put us up there with the biggest, you know, I, I will, that will position us as the biggest, even bigger than most brand agencies. So it's a huge jump um, and we're ready for the ride. Yeah, and, and I want to dig into the affiliate and trim down club before we get to some of the, the partners piece. But um, if people are wondering, they could check out um, Kendigo, which is K E N D A G O dot com. You know, when you're running the affiliate traffic, you know, and people are like, oh, wow, they're getting lots of sales for us. Talk about some of those, um, those early on uh, programs that you ran and, and what you did. Yeah. So, Back then, it was like the Wild West. We were always clean and compliant and, and had great relationships with the networks, which is really the backbone of the company and the business we have here is our relationships um, and what we're able to do with them. So in the day, we were like the hidden agency out of Israel, let's say. A lot of people knew what was going on and the scale that was going on behind the scenes in terms of acquisition and success, but nobody really knew who we were because of the way we positioned as an affiliate. So we were running you know, top brands like Biotrust, Beyond Diet, um, and taking these companies to beyond, some of them beyond 200 million and so forth with specific you know, traffic sources exclusively, but nobody really knew who we were. So we were kind of hiding still and the secret wasn't really out. Other Why than is that? that? Look, I think at the time when you're an affiliate, it's a different mindset. And the, the strategy of the business was very, very exclusive to a, a few select partners. So at the time when we were working, for example, with Biotrust, we were very committed to only work with them as a supplement provider. 
we didn't want to branch out and be too wide. We wanted to give them all of our resources since we didn't have as much at the time. Like today, we have a lot of resources. We have a lot of departments. We're, we're not sil siloed. We all work together. So it was just a different mentality back then. And we weren't necessarily willing to share those secrets and really reveal what was going on since we were exclusively focused with those few select partners. So you take on a BioTrust. Yeah. What are the things that you're doing like so people can understand the methodology? Yeah. So – Look, in the past, it was different. I'll tell you the methodology. So yeah. in the past, we focused predominantly on cold traffic only. So the cold audiences that most people were not able to convert successfully, we were very skilled at bringing these cold audiences in through video sales letters, long videos, infomercials, and getting them to buy after they watch it. So we were experts at hooking them in while still being compliant, while still working in a heavily regulated niche of health and wellness and supplements and physical stuff and making it work. So we focused on everything on the ad side from building the campaigns to positioning of the creatives, the hooks, the angles, and we got the offers approved through the networks. So instead of having to fight against the networks like Facebook or Google to keep your accounts active, we were working as a partner of theirs in a three-way relationship, let's say, that was meant for the long term. So most affiliates will run an offer for like a few months, make a lot of money, and then drop you out and leave you hanging to dry. So we took a different angle or we had a different path to su success where we said, look, let's get the blessing of the network and let's run this as long as it can convert for as long as the funnel stays optimized and that's what we did with these leading brands at the time and that was really the start of something big online because those were the days where like i said those companies were at the top um of the online world as you know oh and so we'll talk about the shift of what you're doing now but you said two big things okay one component you know video sales letter so I, i'm love to have you break down some of the things that you think about with a successful video sales letter and two you mentioned compliance which is an issue for a lot of people using some of these platforms like facebook right so talk about the video sales letter and make justin goff and stefan and georgie proud yeah. with um what are some of the components that you look at with converting I mean, you're converting the coldest of cold traffic to buyers through video sales letters. So what do you think about when creating that? Yeah, look, I don't specifically create them, but I love to use them and I'm able to adapt them and also make them compliant, of course. So I love a video sales letter. The best thing for us as advertisers is to be able to bring in as big of an audience, as broad, maybe even global in many cases as possible. Um, without that, it limits the amount of customers we can acquire and our reach, of course, which we don't want to do. So the video sales letter is a, is a funnel to, to warm people up, okay? It builds an emotional connection with your viewers to the point where they will spend more with you um, and they will build trust with you where they wouldn't have that same trust if they were going to see something positioned as a sale or you see the product in your face. It's not like we're Nike. It's not like we're Adidas. We're, we're not able to sell them on something that maybe a friend told them, that another friend told them. It doesn't always work that way. And a lot, a large portion of the sales actually comes from cold audiences. Um, so I think the most important thing is how do you warm these audiences up? And most of it is done through storytelling um and emotional connections and relationships that you build with them throughout this journey so the longer the journey this can really help you reach um more and more people and bring them in where they weren't really ready to buy originally like they don't have their credit card ready they don't know you they don't trust you so in these situations when you're not a big brand you have to be able to position yourself in a way to compete and the video sales letter brings them in and touches um on the emotional side and it brings you uh to levels that are unmatched, I would say. And it's something that can work on every traffic source. A good video can sell across even TV, digital, everywhere other than, okay, maybe the newspaper and stuff, but you can write stuff specifically to be- You can transcribe uh, that video sales letter. Exactly. Yeah. So this kind of marketing, direct response uh, marketing is really the key to huge growth. And if you can do it compliant and in a way 
that makes sense for your business, it can still be a sellable business, in my opinion. So, so Adam, a, a couple things to unpack there. So I also geek out on direct response. I think it's the foundation of pretty much everything. I mean, um, so but when we're talking about emotional connection in video, I don't know if you can give an example. Um, I don't know if it was a BioTrust video or Organifi video or Beyond Diet video. Some. What's a story that you told that your company told in one of the videos that would give it be an example of uh, an emotional connection that would you know warm up an audience? I guess you could say. Look, during the BioTrust days, they were really the king of animation. Their VSLs, their video sales letters and infomercials, had great animation and graphics. So when they told their story, they were also writing it on the whiteboard. And this was during the times that FedEx and UPS were also transitioning to this on their video ads. I don't know if you remember that, but everything was becoming a whiteboard and the marker would draw the story in the same yes. speed as it's explained, if not faster. And it didn't make sense. How could this be happening? So this, when, when this was happening, it really built a connection where people could not just hear it, but they can see it. And that basically built an emotional connection in its own way. Um, in terms of like storytelling and getting deeper on the emotional side um, and aspects of things is usually when you position a story, let's say from a doctor or an expert, and then they're finding their way or teaching their client or someone along the way how to do something. So a lot of the video sales letters focus on a hero, you know what I mean? The, the whole process that we all know in direct response, um, where they focus on someone has a pain point, they need to get from here to there, and this guide or, uh, or expert is guiding them along the way. So usually that is what works um, the best, and just how you say it kind of changes between copywriters, mm -hmm. the top copywriters out there. Um, but if you have this method uh, in place, usually you can make a successful uh, yeah. VSL. As Stefan, of course, you take them um, across, you know, along the hero's journey. Yeah. Um, so compliant, compliance-wise, how do you navigate the compliance side? Yeah, compliance is tricky. I used to hate it. I couldn't deal with it in the early days. Um, I would always have to take myself back and look at it from a different perspective. Um, what really helped us specifically was being a premium vendor with Trim Down Club, as well as being an affiliate in the past and now being an agency. So we see it from all directions. And we always had Facebook, Google, uh, Native, all the networks, we always had their support beyond VIP support. We were always very close with them. You know, even to this day, for years and years, we meet with them once a week or twice a week, each of them individually. So that relationship gives us an understanding of what is the policy, what's changing on the dot. Like the policy can change overnight. Like when I presented, I think at Justin Golf's uh, event with Stefan, is that I said this presentation might be exact and, and true right now, but in a week it might change. That's how compliance works, and that's how a lot of these affiliates and these at, these vendors get in trouble. It's like they think they're compliant, but then all of a sudden the algorithm or something changes, and now they're screwed. And that's usually why accounts get shut down. So we have this, you know, great relationship with them. We understand what's going to be launched, what's what's allowed, what's not allowed, and we know it before we speak with them. And what we usually do is we get our brands to meet or be approved prior to working with us. What does that mean? We take them and we present them to Facebook, to Google, and show that the benefit of this relationship between all of us, that this is going to help them in their portfolio and their success as Facebook and their growth um, with different types of customers and provide them with great experience on their platform. And we need your support, both of us and all together is how we're going to reach the kind of scale in the compliant way. So we don't really rely on the networks for policy, we dictate that from all of our um, hands-on experience. Then we just get updated from time to time on the nuances that change over time. Adam, what are some of the underutilized traffic sources? You know, people do know of Facebook and Google, but you kind of take all of them in. What are some ones that people should be thinking about? Yeah, so I'm a big, big believer right now in Taboola and Outbrain. Um, I think that they are really the future since they merged recently. 
you know, Taboola was already big in its own right. And now that they merge with Outbrain, I think that provides a really big, big potential, very fruitful potential there is sitting and waiting because not many advertisers know how to do it and especially do it well. So the kind of, you know, processes that we have in place and creatively, um, that's where we have a lot of high hopes. Um, and of course, all the main channels, you know, Instagram, Facebook, um, YouTube is big. Um, all of the main traffic sources, Google is also unique. Not many people know how to do Google advertising for cold audiences. So display and search, not on brand keywords, but more, you know, out there with the mass keywords. Market. Yeah, most people don't know how to do it. Most people are on Google and they're retargeting, which leaves all the cold traffic for us. So we'll talk about the risks of even telling people on your website, uh, trim down club and the worry that people just knock you off and figure, you know, enter your funnel and, you know, just start to copy what you do. Yeah. Look, we've always been copied. From day one, we were really behind the five foods never eat. I don't know if you ever saw those banner ads on Google Display over the years. So we started running those at scale. Every advertiser, every affiliate, every vendor copied us, of course. This was happening for about four to five years. Um, and we were still scaling because no one had the funnel like us. So they might copy the ad but they would never know how to make a good VSL or they would never know how to monetize customers after the sale. So we always had the proper methods in place that would help us be able to scale and reach the highest bids in the auction. Um, so that always gave us the upper hand, um, but it always happened. Five foods to never eat. One tip of a flat belly was ours as well. Oh, yeah. um, all of those things over the years um, were copied millions of times and eventually they got saturated because of it by the way so they do it does saturate the market but the market is huge in health and wellness so it didn't really cause um any concern for us and we we ran it for many years but yeah uh yeah because i would think okay well let's not put the uh, the trim down club on anything because people are going to now look trim down club and they'll seek you out um can you break down the general funnel so like add to what happens after that yeah so like i said i'm i'm a firm big believer in vsls i think that a vsl can tell a story in so many different ways and bring so many different types of audiences i'm another huge believer in pre-landers so avatorials but not shady scammy articles that bring people in or or, or that are used as compliance to like some people use avatorials as a way to circumvent policy and that's the wrong way to use them. You should go clean from the beginning. You can go direct to the VSL. There's no reason to put a pre-lander in front. The benefit of a pre-lander, which most people don't realize, is that it's a way to scale sideways, is what I call it. Hmm. So it gives you different positioning and angles and hooks on the front after your ads. And for example, let's say you have a joint pain product, okay? You can come at it with and it's a nutritional product or a supplement. It could be anything. So you can come at it with five worst foods for arthritis, 10 best foods for arthritis, one sinister protein or joint pain protein. So I'm targeting three different types of audiences on the same exact product and funnel at the end of the day. So the only difference is the pre-lander, which opens up my ads and I'm able to reach more people sideways. So it's a different way of scaling up um, instead of just one funnel, which is very, you know, stuck on one angle. So I'm big on pre-landers, but uh, yeah, look, I think quizzes are really, really great. I think quizzes also are a way to bring in a mass audiences for cold uh, traffic. So you can bring in a lot of different men and women looking for many different things and have a funnel that's optimized specifically to their needs by them taking a quiz. So it's not BS, again, not for compliance purposes, but you're funneling them through, asking them specific questions and giving them a detailed, personalized It's a better plan. customer experience. Yeah, it's a better customer experience. They're more involved. So th there's a journey to it. So they're, they're going to spend money if they're interested, like you're already building that relationship that we talked about. And now you're personalizing your sales pitch. So before where you just send them to a VSL and it's like, wait, 
I'm 60 years old, that relates to 70 years old, or 30 years old, that relates to 70, it's not going to catch. You lost those people, which is fine. You're still going to do well. But with the quiz, you can personalize each aspect of your uh, funnel after the quiz. And then from there, you can bring in much larger audiences at scale across all the networks. So add pre-lander, video sales letter, or some type of customized, um, you know. For cold audiences, yeah. I would yeah. have something in place like that. But uh, yeah, look, you can even have an e-commerce hybrid. There's many types of funnels that work. But if you're looking collectively of, across all of the channels like we do in the opportunity on Google, like there is on Facebook, um, I would look towards funnels that are more able to bring in larger audiences. So after VSL, directly to product, directly to sale? Uh, usually after the VSL, yeah. It, it's to the order form in most cases. And then what's the, I don't know, common practice or, or what you've seen work as far as um, upsells or after order? Look, upsells, I think Justin Goff and them have it down pat. I think what we've seen with our clients who also work with them it has always been um, more of the same. So you have your upsells, which if it's a supplement, you sell them more of the same. So six bottles mm -hmm. of the same thing. Usually that's what they want. This is why they're in the funnel. Don't give them something they don't want. You want to keep it uh, congruent. Um, also, if it's digital, let's say, maximize results. So if you're selling maybe a workout, how can you make this workout 10 times more effective? Maybe now it's a supplement you're selling them in this case. Maybe it's nutrition, combining the power of fitness with nutrition. So maybe it's a membership. Maybe because they get this membership, which is just a subscription, which is recurring, where you can make more money on the customer lifetime value, which is great for paid media. So the more money you have to work with, the higher bids. In those cases, um, a membership can be great. Let's give you, you know, access to all this material that's always updated and at this point you're making a killing on the membership so there's many strategies but those are the main thanks adam yeah that's that's very valuable um what about offers um throughout the years um or recently what surprised you about offers that have worked or what have people included in offers yeah um Look, what's really taken off, I think, in the last year or two has been testimonials. I think brands that speak through others or that have strong presenters that can relate to the audience or that show that the end point. So these are presenters who look perfect or look like someone that they can either trust if it's a doctor or if it's someone that's the expert or the guru that, wow, they have such a great body. Only if I had that, they speak in a way that relates to me. So between the two of those avenues, those have really taken off in the last, you know, two or three years have been uh, testimonials speaking through the customer in their experience, as well as presenters, um, if it's an expert doctor or a guru. Yeah. Adam, you know, I don't know if you realize, but um, I think in book titles. And so you said something today that I think should be your or your company's book. Okay. Um, scaling Sideways. It's um, a good one. You know, um, it's it's unique. And, and anyway, so uh, food for thought on that I'm one. I'm going to write it down. You said it. <laughs> You know, like you said, the best copywriters, they basically listen to what someone's saying and they take those words and reflect them back to themselves. So um, scaling sideways. The the I'm curious, you know, I've not seen any better way of really learning about a company than buying their stuff. Right. You buy their stuff. You enter yep. into their world. So, you know, let's say Russell Brun Brunson comes out of the a webinar and I will buy their book. I will buy their upsells. Uh, their audio because I like the information, but I also am curious about what they're doing. Um, I am curious who are the ones that you have entered into, the brands that you're really you respect, and you're like, I'm going to buy their stuff because I like them, but also because I respect them as a as a company and how they market. Most of the clients that I've respected, I ended up working with them. Yeah, like most of the people, not clients. So, so most of the brands, like in terms of business development, where do I look? I look at brands that I desire to be with because they have something unique, like you said. So maybe it's their upsell process. Maybe it's their funnels. Maybe their quizzes are great. Maybe it's their presenters. I've always positioned 
you know, the growth of the agency with the kind of unique clients that have their specifics, like they have their, their own unique way of doing business. And that's pretty much how we've gotten, you know, clients is, is working with these kind of companies. So I will, like you said, I will buy the, the program or, or buy the supplement, see how they're, you know, selling it, how they upsell, how do they uh, do SMS, how do they do phone calls? I look at the whole business to understand how they treat the user experience as well as what is the growth potential. So how do I understand the growth potential? I can see the communities that they have and how they're speaking and monetizing them and uh, what they're not utilizing. So maybe they have their unique way of doing business, but they're not taking advantage of eight to 10 things that can help them, which really we see because if you have like 30 plus clients, we have about 35 to 40 brands now across the network. So I see things that some clients do well, but others don't. And then you have your, you have your wild cards that do many things well, of course, that are 10, 11 figure businesses, but not everyone is there. And some are maybe seven or eight figures and they're trying to get there. So that's the unique approach that we take is just understanding really what these businesses do and then try to work with the ones that we can help them scale beyond eight figures, of course, um, and also helping the larger businesses as being kind of an extension of their internal media team. So once these brands get beyond nine or 10 figures, they already have a media team, of course. Um, so we don't always just stay as the last line of defense or the last agency, like the Rolls Royce agency, let's say, where people choose us after trying many other agencies as the last option, let's say. Um, we're also in a position where we are an extension of other media buying teams. So let's say you have 20 media buyers, you're running on Facebook, you're doing huge volumes, everything is great in email marketing. We'll come in, we'll run on Google, Taboola, um, YouTube, and so forth. So we take it to the next level in that balance and uh, we diversify their business and that scale is again, scaling sideways, but this time through different networks. So Adam, who should be working with you now? You're the business development guy. <laughs> like if someone knows someone, I mean, who should be working with you, your company right now? What brands, what, what people? Uh, who should be working with us? It's tricky. Right now, I have a, w a wait list. Um, mm -hmm. But I would love to – we've done some work in the past with um, with a company called Lady Boss. I really like what they do um, on Facebook. I think they're doing more YouTube these days, so we can probably help them big time. Mm -hmm. um, haven't spoke to them in some time. And uh, I really love uh, – who's another one? What Yoga Burn is doing. Those guys at Yoga Burn, great guy over there. And uh, yeah, look, for, for me, th the main thing is knowing that I have the right amount of resources and people, skilled people um, to run the, uh, the brands and be there as a point of contact and so forth for scale. So for me right now, I'm maxed out, but it doesn't mean that in a few weeks that, that won't change. So yeah. So who's qualified to work with you? Someone's hearing you. This guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about. The company sounds amazing. Who's qualified to work with you? Who's qualified to work with us? So you're saying in terms of what, what I generally yeah, like look a good, for? Yeah, a good fit for a company. Like obviously if someone's just starting out, probably not a good time. Like they need to have stuff dialed in. Yeah. At what so, point does it make sense to bring on uh, Kendigo? It's a good point. So I have two ways that I look at things. I like to take on clients that are, have huge potential and even heavy risk, but they own their own brand and they're very motivated. So let's say they're making seven figures. They're, they're on ClickBank. They're on these other affiliate platforms. They're doing well with email marketing and other avenues and revenue streams, but they really haven't gotten paid media to work or they have with affiliates only. So in that case, I know I can grow them exponentially um, to heights they've never seen and do it for years. So a lot of our clients we've worked with on, up until today for three or four years and more. That's most of our clients are in that uh, positioning. And then on the other side, I love to work with big brands that are serious about media. As I said before, I can be an extension of either their internal media team or I can be their entire media team and their entire creative team. So 
we are uniquely built where we have a creative agency and a PPC agency under the same roof that are not siloed and that work together. So I have 30 plus people in our creative team. We've invested millions and millions of dollars in the last year alone in the creative. And that gives me the ability to do everything for them um, that they could not necessarily do internally in most cases. Um, just because of the methods, the strategies, the brainstormings, and the uh, global reach with the PPC and the experience we have. So we bring all of that together. Um, so we work with big clients and we work with seven figures and build them up. So it's pretty open, but we do look for something that's somewhat optimized. We don't like to come into a brand that's doing like five or six figures and they have this big potential and it's like, it's not ready yet. We we know that they will come to us at some point. It's just the way it has funneled um, uh, up until now is that they'll work with another agency out there, either in the U.S. or, or abroad. And then they'll be like, look, we, we need better numbers. The creative is lacking. Um, we need more scale. Maybe we can try different angles. This agency hasn't done that for us. So I'm always – prefer I always prefer to be in a position where these people end up coming to us as their last agency so we can start scaling them up um, and give them the attention they never got. So how did you meet Justin and Stefan? Justin and Stefan, that's a great question. Let me go back in my head and think when did I meet them? Um Stefan, I think I met, yeah, I met Stefan at TNC Traffic and Conversion Summit. I think three years ago at a uh, get together that was right before the um, internet marketing party, not at the internet marketing party, but just shout out to it. David Gonzalez. Yeah, yeah. He's the man. I love that guy. So I met him there. We talked a bit at the time. He wasn't, he was copywriting, but I think it was for his internal brands and he was really running Redox um, at the time. So he was just becoming huge. Like he was, Super cool, super down to earth. And you were seeing him in the early stages of his growth because he's taking off now, of course. Um, and Justin Goff, I met him, um, I believe it was through his newsletter. I think I signed up to his newsletter. Mm, his email. about yeah. yeah, his email newsletter about two years ago. I reached out to him. I saw he was doing copywriting and I realized that I'm working with like most of his clients. So I sent him an email to get on a Zoom call. It's actually a funny story. So I, I sent him an email to get on a Zoom call. I was five minutes late to the first Zoom call. Maybe 10 minutes. Let's be You're on nice. Israeli time. Yeah, yeah let's like be nice about minutes. it. I was like five, <laughs> 10 minutes late. I was like, I'm juggling the kids in one hand and I'll have like an espresso in the other hand. I'm like, he'll be there. Don't worry. And he's, he's like writing me emails about being like a few minutes late. I'm like, oh God, this is not a good start. So I jump on the call. He's like, okay, Adam, I got to reschedule. We'll do it in two or three weeks. He put like a date and I was like, oh no. It's like I, I put aside all this time and effort and I'm like juggling my kids and it's like I lost that opportunity. So it actually taught me to, to be on time and not just you know practice what you preach basically. And uh, we ended up hitting it off. We had a great call. And uh, since then, I ended up, you know, as you know, I attend their events um, all the time. They have great events. Um, our clients are always there and always getting, gaining great strategies from those two fellas. Mm. So can't speak enough about Talk them. Talk about the team, Adam, um, the team at Kendigo. Yeah. So the team right now is about 60 plus internally. Um, we have a lot of outsourced and freelancers, which probably equals up to a hundred. Um, but they're not fully employed with us salary wise. Um, the team from the leadership. Meet, yeah. How'd you meet the leadership? The leadership from the top is, um, like I said, it's comp composed of really engineers. So these are like technical wizards that, you know, know their data, analytics, um, campaign management and so forth. Like they're numbers people. Um, totally opposite of what really I am. Um, I'm a relationship guy. I like to do creative stuff. I'm kind of there. Um, I got into this business with them about eight years ago when I moved to Israel. So my wife um, was Israeli. We were living in the U.S. And mm -hmm. I made the move to Israel and we st we're starting a life here. And I learned Hebrew within about five months. Wow. And 
I, I saw this. Um, job when you got post. married, Adam, did you know yeah. you were going to move back to? You were in Florida. Did you know you were going to move to Israel? No. No. Not at she all. just lured you in. She's like, "Oh, by the way, we're moving to Israel." No, it, it it was pretty quick, actually, and it was pretty reckless looking back. But I'm happy I reckless did it. Reckless? Why? Reckless because I didn't know anyone here, mm. and I was coming into a world that's you know on a whole nother level, even beyond New York. I think you've been here probably, and it's just a different. It's a rat race, and if you're not in the right mentality, you can lose, and lose badly. Let's say. Um, so anyways, I, I saw the job post. Um, I got it from this uh, supervisor that was just kind of guiding me with my, um, with my trip to Israel, like to get me more involved with the community and so forth. So I got a job post. They were looking for a social media wizard was the job description. It sounded really weird at the time, like who's using this kind of language. So I was like interested. I was like, oh, cool. Social media wizard. I went in. I spoke with them. They were working out of a kibbutz. I don't know if you know what a kibbutz is. So they're working out of this small house on this kibbutz, this small community where everyone's in it together. And it was like five people. And I get there to the job interview and I'm like, I want this job. Okay. So they're like, no, we really don't have this position anymore. Someone ended up filling it, but we do have a customer service position. So I ended up starting in the company. Most people don't know this. So I ended up starting about eight years ago as a customer service rep, one of three at the time as Trim Down Club was just starting and scaling. I'm talking about thousands and thousands of paid customers a day and not cheap customers, like high paying customers. And our customer support was just hiring like crazy. So then mm. I came in to fill in that void and be one of them. Um, and at that stage, I just worked my way up, you know, hard mm. work and dedication and motivation. And just I said, look, if I'm going to succeed here in Israel, mm -hmm. there's no better place to do it than to learn Hebrew, but also be, you know, positioned in the Western markets um, and be a globally recognized brand. Because all of our business is, you know, in the U.S., in Europe, it's not really in Israel, although we're positioned here, um, which is great for policy and relationships with the networks because all the hubs and headquarters of Facebook and so forth is about five to 10 minutes from our office. So it's a benefit, actually. So, yeah, I started working there, just moved my way up and haven't looked back since. And we're just trying to take what over the you, world. Adam, learn about doing customer support with that volume of people on the front lines. What were some of the things you had to handle? <laughs> templates, templates, templates. Scripts, that, scripts, templates, be prepared. You know that you're coming into a thousand emails a day. You're getting calls. You're getting chats. There, you can't hide. So it, it mm -hmm. built up your ability to deal with pressure, which really helped as we grew the agency. As a customer service support person, how do you take an irate person or someone who wants to cancel and move them into more of a happiness situation? Look, you, you always have to relate to them and show empathy. I think the main thing is that you need to bring yourself down to their level because they're in a level of, you know, they're, they're sh expressing hatred in, in most, most cases because, unfortunately, direct response doesn't always bring the best side out of people, especially upsell funnels and cross-selling them, which has really been something to talk about over the years in this space, um, is how to tone it down and still convert or still monetize successfully. So it was really bringing yourself down to their level and talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. At the end of the day, you're both normal you know, human beings. You're both there for, to succeed. And my goal, let's say if I was a customer service rep, was to get on their level, show empathy, and then make them into loyal customers. Because at the end of the day, they signed up for a reason. Maybe something ticked them off, but at the end of the day, they, they have a pain point and you need to address that with a benefit. So it usually worked out. Mm. Software. What software do you use internally? What, what do you like? What should people think about using? Look, software, a lot of what we have is internally made just because it supports what we do best. So we have a lot of tech um, built into what we do um, with the vendor, but most importantly, the agency. So we took it over from the vendor throughout all those years. Um, so we have an R&D team actually in-house. Hmm. So we have many developers and data scientists sitting on the internal payroll that have been with us for five plus years 
And this is outside of the leadership team, which I said are great with numbers. So what that really does is provides a balance. So a lot of our systems and methods um, are built on machine learning as well as manual um, management. So it's just a balance between the two that really helps us uh, you know, scale the campaigns and even with creative and bringing that information between the teams. So it's a communication thing as well. Also alert systems and understanding when there's issues with like, there are many cases, almost most of the time, I would say the majority where we know if there's an issue with a brand's funnel, let's say, or marketing before they even know it's happening. It could be shipping. It could be, um, that their website is down. We usually know it and trigger and call the client and tell them before they know it. So it's a huge advantage technology if you use it in the right way. And uh, that's something that we do well. Another thing it helps with is positioning in terms of the amount of money you have to spend on advertising. So our scientists, data scientists and numbers people, they're able to break down the lifetime value of a customer, for example, like work with subscription models. So if you don't know your numbers, you're not in the game. But if you know your numbers, you can optimize and outbid in the auctions. So we're able to calculate the lifetime value regardless of the funnel. So we have great insight that has been learned basically from being a premium vendor mm. for eight plus years. So that's the benefit. Some of the Israeli companies you respect and the people as you've been there that you like. Yeah, I love, which I was telling you, I think on... The other day on Messenger, I was telling you about natural intelligence. I love what they do mm. over there at natural intelligence. A lot of people don't know about them, so shout out to them. They run um, comparison websites um, at scale. So they'll mm. be on Google search and Facebook, even in some cases and other places. Um, and they'll give you, let's say you're looking for a, a diet or looking for something on search. They will give you a comparison table of the top 10 diets that match your needs. Yeah. And it's a great user experience. And it's like they're giving you a helping hand in your search because you don't have time to go to 10 different websites when you're undecided. So they're helping you there and helping the consumer in real time. And I think that's great. And that's uh, mm -hmm. probably one of my favorites. Who are some others? So I reached out to them after you suggested them. Yeah. I got a response from surprisingly from from near greenberg the founder yeah. and ceo he goes i don't like doing interviews pretty good. <laughs> so i didn't stop there trust me but uh near if you're hearing this i'm gonna keep emailing you but um what other companies that you respect and most people maybe have never heard of because they're not you know dialed into the you know israeli startup or or entrepreneur culture yeah uh, let's think another one that's big, that's maybe unheard of. Hmm. It's tricky. You know, most of my most work people, is in the US. Most people would have heard of mobile in Israel, or is that not that common? Yeah. 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 But you already said that. So, yeah, I'm just curious because, you know, someone introduced me to mobile. I'd never heard of them because they're just the engine behind fueling a ton of people. You don't really yeah. hear of them in the US of like, oh, this is mobile. You hear of Intel, you hear of you know, the big car manufacturers. Yeah. But some uh, of the stuff, in, you know, like you said, you're kind of behind the scenes of some of these brands, right? And so it's like Intel inside, like Kendigo is kind of fueling this, but people aren't like shouting Kendigo from the rooftops. Look, it, it depends if you can only work with so many people. So the clients are, but behind the scenes, we've always kept it kind of silent or tight-lipped until now. Like now we're saying, look, we're at massive hyper growth. We're going to be hiring. We're going to be close to 100 plus people soon internally, not just with outsource. So it would be close to maybe 200 if you include outsource. Um, so we're huge at this stage. So we need to make sure that um, we get the word out there and be able to funnel the right people in. So that's the initiative at this stage for me. Um, look, there's a lot of great Israeli startups. So if you take is Israel in general, it's startup nation. So you have all of these amazing startups. And I think that's really the key to people's intrigue when they hear about Mobileye. So they started, they had this idea, they put it into work. It took years and then boom, Intel, you know what I mean? They just took off. They got bought out and it was just a huge acquisition. And it's like, it's the kind of story everyone wants to hear. It's like the underdog kind of story. The underdog makes it, wins. 
you know, the championship. Um, some others that I like that are kind of aiming there would be, um, I don't know if you ever heard of Day 2. Day 2 mm -hmm. um, is a company that measures your your parameters or your DNA in your um, stool, which is kind of – Oh, really? Yeah. They, they measure your stool – in order to lose weight or to understand mm -hmm. what you can do on the health side with your life for a healthy lifestyle. So that's, that's Israeli interesting. company. Yeah. Was that so a that, company that would hire you guys or no? Yes and no. The thing is what we usually shy away from, it's not all the time. We, we've done partnerships and we're very flexible with our terms, which is unique for I can see some great agent. video sales letters with that. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can knock it out of the park with them. But the thing is, we usually do, as we said before, look for, for brands that are more on the next stage of growth, where we know we have them positioned and they have the teams in place that they can grow with us. Like, we don't want to take something and do all the work. Like, I'll, we will run out of resources um, at our company. So even though we can do it, I prefer to be partnered with someone and take it for many years to come and do mm. it the right way. Mm. It's balance. Adam, let's point people towards your site and any other places. First of all, thank you. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for going late. I'm sorry to Adam's wife um, for taking him <laughs> late. So please watch us. And uh, if you're in Chicago, drinks and dinners on me. Um, go to Kendago, K-E-N-D-A-G-O.com. Any other places people should learn more. I actually have a great tool I want to share with everyone. Yeah. It's not even it's not even my tool, by the way. That's totally how cool. do I share it with them now? Um just On say it and we can like link it up. A way to put it in the chat and yeah. it will show. I'll put Let's it in the that. chat. What is it? Here. Just share it with you in the chat here that's private. Here, see if you see this. I do. Okay. So this tool. I like to give something away for free. I always like to do it. And I don't speak often on these calls. As you know, it took us so long to get get on together from the time we met. Um, so this tool is a tool that's native to Tabula. And it's a way to check your titles, your headlines um, for strength. So you can compare different headlines for different angles or even the same angle. And you can see how it will perform on Tabula. But it will also give you a general understanding of how it will perform in terms of click-through rate, so CTR. So this is a great tool for advertisers, vendors, email marketers that are doing subject line tests. This tool is really underused. I don't know many people that use it, and it's something I've been using for over a year easily. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a great jump start for anyone trying to test messaging because we all know marketing messaging and positioning is really the key to get people to click through and get them to the next stage is all that's what direct response is we need people to click through so it's a great so i'll read it out um i put it in the link uh, i think it shows up on youtube for some reason not facebook but <laughs> trends.tabula.com slash titles trends.tabula.com slash titles adam i want to be the first one to thank you this has been awesome i really appreciate it yeah. So in terms of website and reaching us, because you said that before. Yeah. So you can just reach us pretty easily at www.kendago.com. That's K-E-N-D-A-G-O.com. Um, you can also reach me even directly on Skype at adam.feldman and then the number nine. So adam.feldman9. Um, I'm always on Skype. And then email adam.feldman at kendago.com. Pretty simple. And don't shy away. Always here. <laughs> Very generous of you. Thanks, everyone. See you guys. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.